Hello everyone, and welcome back to a special episode of my Dragon Quest VI 100% walkthrough. First of all, be sure to fill Ashlyn up, Barbara, with as many herbs as you can. Make sure that, and I would also strongly recommend that all the others are filled up with herbs as well. I, I only have the three herbs on Carver or Hassan right now, but I think that was a mistake. And you'll see why in this upcoming boss fight. And also you can rest up for free there. Seems pretty good. Also, these poison swamps, they do one HP of damage every time you walk on them but they only hurt your active party members, which is why I'm only having one or two out at a time. But now we're in a dungeon, so we can't tag in and out anymore. Pretty interesting how the lighting works. Like it just fades out seamlessly. I like that. This really is a beautiful game, isn't it? Pretty much. So what is All right. the... What? What is the upcoming boss fight gonna be? Um, against that lizard thing on the thumbnail. Anyways, so... I'm actually deviating from the speedrun route here. Now, what the route would do is it would start running from everything. However, that only leaves barely barely enough experience to survive the boss fight after this boss fight if nobody dies. Now, this fight is tough enough that I can't guarantee everyone's survival. So, instead what I'm doing is I'm fighting everything that I know I can kill in two rounds. Like, for example, those bird things, they have 60 to 70 HP depending on the version. So if I find more than one of them in a single fight, I'll run. Um, also, those little butterfly fly things, they have the uh, Dazzle or Surround spell. If that lands on your party, it reduces all of them to 25% accuracy. That's uh, six sand attacks, just so you know. Which is pretty terrible. Yeah. Now these guys, on the other hand, they're not too tough. They can cast Infernos, but I can kill them in two rounds, just like that. So those guys I fight. The and the birds yeah. actually remind me of a route in Blue Kaizo, and I've mentioned this game before in this series, but there's a route where there's a lot of bird keepers, and they have like these dojis with hyper beam, like Furos as well. It's pretty brutal. Yeah, that, uh, Kaizo really did live up to its name, didn't it? Definitely did. Be better, though. Be better game. Through the point. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, I'll say this. It's, it was more interesting than, uh, when I usually play Pokemon, even if I didn't play it quite the way you would have wanted me to. Do you do those, what do you call them, randomizer runs? Do you do those? No, I just, I don't like the idea of that sort of randomness. Anyways, oh. okay. Um, you'll want to make sure that Rex is the guy healing. You'll want to save Millie's MP for this fight, and Rex doesn't use that MP for much of anything. Also, make sure you run from these guys. Not only do they have that Firebane spell, which does a lot of damage, but they can also cast Iron Eyes or Kaklang. That renders them invincible for a few rounds in exchange for them not being able to attack. So they waste time, and they also have a lot of defense and HP. You need to get the Sap spell on them just to be able to damage them decently. So run from those guys, and if you run into two of those at once, be prepared to accept the fact that you might 
die from that if you get lucky, unlucky running. And no, it wouldn't be more practical to fight them, because what you need to be able to do is you need to get sleep or snooze on one of them, and then before that guy wakes up, you kill the other one with two saps and melee attacks. However, snooze only has a 50% chance of working on one of them, so you're rolling the dice every time you choose to fight them, unless you're really overleveled, which we are not, because I don't roll that way. And again, we're running from these guys because they have a lot of HP. They're not dangerous, but they're just annoying. So, when you try to run in this game, what are you, like, what are you, I guess, sacrificing? Um, you're sacrificing experience and gold. Yeah, but like, trying to run, you're, you're basically rolling the dice, right? Yeah. Um, it's 50% chance of getting away the first two times, 75% the third time, and then 100% the fourth time. Now the reason it's so practical, is, especially in this version, is because the enemies, each one has a 50% chance of not doing anything if you try to run. The remakes don't have that, but Super Nintendo, it's kind of generous that way. That's almost a little overpowered. It is a little bit. That said, I still consider it the harder version, because in the remakes, the casino gear you get is so stupidly good and so easy to get. You've got the dragon shields and platinum mail, you can get Yggdrasil leaves, magic waters, and all that good stuff, and plus, all the enemies give like 120% the experience in gold they do in this version. Why is that? I don't really know, to be honest. What I suspect is that uh, the Super Nintendo version is kind of janky, so I'm guessing when they remade it, they wanted to smooth out the difficulty curve a bit. Also, you'll see me navigating the dark, uh, you'll see that I slow down for a bit. Make sure you follow my movements exactly, or you'll fall into some invisible pitfalls. Um, cause the way you're supposed to solve this is that there are these four buttons that you press scattered throughout the dungeon. Um, I'll link the supplemental walkthrough, the text walkthrough, in the description so you can read that in more detail, but Basically, we're skipping the intended parts of this dungeon because I know how to navigate in the dark. So pay attention to my movements if you want to do what I do. And one last thing, there's this encounter with four grim, grim, grim grinners or dark imps. They're orange guys with swords and shields. If you're playing this version, Make sure that Ashland defends. They have concentrated and inverted targeting, which basically means they will always, always attack Ashlyn until she dies. So make sure to defend with her and heal her up as needed. Oh, there's a boss fight. Yep, there's Murda. And this guy, he is the first really tough boss fight in this game. He goes by a semi-fixed attack pattern, and almost all of his things hurt. So defend with everyone but Millie for this first round, and yeah, look, he attacked everyone. That could have done 30 to 40 HP of damage had I not defended. That's round one. Round two, he'll either increase his own defense or attack, so this is the breather round. Make sure most guys are above 62 HP for this third round. Because this one, he could do something called Kafrizzle, which does 52 to 62 points of single target damage to everyone. And then, 
After this turn, he goes back to round one, where he could do Flame Breath again, or attack. So basically how that works is, he goes by a three turn cycle. First turn, he could do Flame Breath, or he could just attack. Second turn, he could cast Upper on himself, or just attack. And third turn, he can, uh, he can use Kefrizzle, or he could just yell in a voice and change your AI settings. If he does the second, it's basically a free turn, because he doesn't actually damage you. So, any questions so far? Well, I'm surprised that he doesn't really summon any minions. You'd think he would. He seems like a king, so... Uh, more on that later. <laughs> I mean, otherwise, like, what what other attacks do you have to watch out for other than Frizzle? Um, the Flame Breath. 30 to 40 to everyone. It sounds pretty dangerous. It is. So, basically... You spend the entire fight preparing for turn one and turn three. Turn two is sort of the breather round, where it's either a single target attack or he just increases his defense, which you just take away with sap. Um, so you have to be very careful. Um, defend with anyone who's below 62 HP if you know he's about to use Kefrizzle. And defend with anyone who's below 30 or 40 or so, when you know he's about to use Flame Breath. You also want to make sure that Millie has the Speed Ring equipped before the fight starts, because then she'll have a 92% chance of going before Murdaw. So she can heal anyone that needs it. Now, that's only 92%, so theoretically, Murdoch can still go before someone and kill them. There's nothing I can really do about that. And that's why I said I need to be able to get more experience from random encounters, because if someone dies here, that could be really bad for the next boss fight, and I can't really control that. I mostly can, but not really, you know what I mean? You're saying that there's an element of randomness to it. Just a small bit of randomness. Not like the next fight coming up, but uh, but even even at this point, he can be dangerous, which is why I'm not fast forwarding through this. You need to be, to be able to know how to fight this guy intelligently. He's tough. I was actually, this is not really related to the boss, but is there a rare candy equivalent, like, to this game? Like, for Pokemon, nope. the item? There isn't one. So you have to grind legit. Yes, you do. Well, actually, I guess the metal slimes kind of count, but they're really hard to kill. They have 999 defense, so... Anytime you do a melee attack, you either do zero damage or one damage. And they so have a 50... What? What happens when you kill them? You get a lot of experience. That's it. Oh, okay. So... And you'll also notice that Rex ran out of HP, Ashlyn ran out of herbs, and Carver ran out of herbs as well. That's why, if you're new to this game, I would recommend getting more herbs for everyone. I managed it because, again, I'm good at it, but... You know, if you don't have those sorts of instincts, you'll, you'll really want to make sure you have plenty of healing. So... From what I understand, the king was transformed into that thing. That's right. And the queen, the uh, man who turned into a woman, or the woman who became a man... 
I don't know just how well they explain this later on, but I'm gonna... So here's the deal. There's the dream world and the real world. In the real world, both of these guys fell into a deep sleep that no one could wake them up from. The king's deal was he was transformed into a clone of Murdaugh. The real one is still out there. And the queen, she dreamed that she was a king who was doing everything in her power to rescue her husband from Murdaugh's curse. She didn't remember all the details, but basically she's trying to turn him back into the uh, man she loved. So, when you used the Mirror of Ra on her, you revealed her true form. I know that's probably doesn't entirely make sense, but, uh, well, it's a weird game. Well, I guess it makes sense on the surface, and that's what it counts. What counts, I mean. That's good to hear. Also, this guy... He's someone we skipped all the way back in part two and I still had Dark Knight 97. He's the uh, four Dark Hobbit fight I was talking to you about. He's the one that will always attack Ashlyn in the Super Nintendo version. Now once we beat this guy and get the treasure behind him, we'll get a ring. A ring that we can give to this random woman. And once we do, she'll give us a seat of strength which we can then use on Carver to increase his attack power. Now again, we skipped this guy in part two, because he was way, way stronger than us all the way back then. So that's why we waited until now to beat him up and get the strength seed. Sounds pretty good. Yeah, well... I mean, it's only two points of strength. That's equal to one extra point of damage, but still, it adds up when you use all of them on Carver. Oh, how many are there? I don't really know. It's well into the double digits, though. I'd estimate, like, I don't know, around 20 throughout the game? So, is it worth it to take them? I think it is. Because he has these multiplier attacks, Carver does. So, like, those seeds of strength, if you use 20 on Carver, that's an average of 20 more points of damage. And then if he uses focus strength, that doubles his next attack's power, which is like the equivalent of 40. And then when he uses another attack on top of that, that can be equivalent to 80 damage. Like, basically, Carver is kind of OP in this game, has OP moves, and they keep multiplying his base attack. So it adds up, is what I'm saying. So is that like the the guy with the purple hair? Yep. Okay, just want to make sure. Okay, next mechanic. I'm gonna use a fairy water right here. Those are basically repels. But they only work on monsters that are way weaker than you. I think five or ten levels below what the hero is. Okay, so here you use a little bit of fast forwarding. Yeah, here we use a bit of fast forwarding, because now we're covering familiar ground. Now, I'm gonna activate a side quest for the future, but I made a but I made a boo-boo here. What you're supposed to do is activate this cutscene here, and the guy will have some dialogue and talk to you. But then you're supposed to talk to him again. That's how you activate the side quest. But I only did the cutscene, which means I had to come back later. So for anyone playing along with me, make sure you avoid that mistake. Okay, so that that's kind of like that's kind of like what happened last time, right? Where you I think you forgot to pick up like the mirror. You had to go back. Well, 
I didn't actually forget. I just pretended to forget. Just to demonstrate a point of how easy it is. Well, the first time you played this game, did you forget to pick oh. a winner? Oh, yeah. Then that sucked. I could imagine that. <sighs> Also, since we're not paying much attention to the story, it's easy to skip this point. But if you paid close attention to the dialogue, someone actually died as a result of us sneaking into the castle in part four. Do you remember how we did that? Yeah, I do. How did they die? Um, basically, they vouched for our authenticity. They mistook us for the real thing. And there was this guard that wanted to keep us from going into the throne room under orders from the Chancellor. But then the captain, Captain Rusty, he was like, Dude, what are you thinking? It's the prince. Come on, let him in. And, however, we were in disguise. So we walked in. Then the prince... Chancellor walked in and then it turned out we didn't know the name of our own sister and so we were exposed as frauds and for that the Chancellor he punished Captain Rusty by sending him into the front lines of a war so they're assuming they he died because he didn't come back which it's it's kind of upsetting because it's like there was no reason for us to sneak into the castle but we did and the guy died because of us or at least we think he did more on that later so it was kind of a pointless death anyways I think that's about it for this episode so God bless you everyone and see you next time. <sighs> okay, well I was uh on the man's death I was actually about to ask whether it was confirmed that he died because it seemed out of place in the game, so Um as far as you're concerned Yes, he is dead. So he... okay. There's something very, very subtle later on that implies that he might have lived. But again, it is so subtle and so late that most players are never going to catch it. Well, since I imagine this game is aimed for children... I can't imagine that he really died, so that's probably why they kept it vague because they didn't want to, t like, they didn't want to touch on that on the topic of death. So I can see that. Well, okay, so there's the real world and the dream world, and everyone has two parts to them, right? Real world and dream world selves. So in this game, it's kind of sort of implied in a few places that what happens to you in the dream world affects you in the real world, and vice versa. And way later on, like right before the final boss, we meet the guy's dream world self. So, going by that logic, one could infer that since his dream world self is alive, that means his real-world self is also alive, even though you never actually meet the guy again in the real world. So you can kind of infer that nothing too bad happened to him, but the only reason it's even relevant is because we decided, a propos of nothing, to disguise ourselves as the prince, march into the castle, pretend to be royalty, and... and then get kicked out, because we had no business being there. So, you're saying that the main character is sneaking to the castle, and you're saying that that was 
unnecessary, but like, was that really just on a whim? Like, did they just not have any other device to drive the plot forward, I guess? Yep. And the game never, ever calls you out on it. Ever. I mean, that's pretty typical that the main characters are not called out for screwing up because they're not supposed to. They're supposed to be idealistic. I mean, I guess, and, you know, I still like the game, but it's just, that still bothers me. I think, I think there is a, a humor, like a humorous quality to it. I can see that. So maybe that's, that's the intention. Well, that or there was a scene they forgot to put in or something. Yeah, I can, I can see that too. Anyways, just wanted to get that off my chest. So, once again, see y'all tomorrow, and God bless you.